In the beginning was the word. And the word was with the rhythm, and the rhythm was with the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word flowed with the rhythm, and the rhythm flowed with the word, and the word and the rhythm was good. In the beginning, there was music, and there was song. And God said, let it flow. Make a joyful noise. Let there be singing. They could beat us. They could beat us. They could throw us in jail, but they could not stop us from singing those songs. It was the songs that gave us power. It was the songs that gave us the will to keep on Pressing on, Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons, veteran of the Civil Rights Movement. Without the songs, without the songs, without the singing, the Civil Rights Movement would have been like a bird without wings. Congressman John Lewis, veteran of the Civil Rights Movement. But what's in a song? There's an African proverb that says, there is no magic more powerful than music. And there's another African proverb, Proverbs 18, 21, that says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I believe both these proverbs to be true. I believe that you will eventually embody that thing, that song that you continue to sing. My ancestors, the ones already here indigenous to this North American soil and the ones who came shackled across deep ocean waters through middle passage and held in bondage in a lifetime of struggle down South Babylon deep in Dixie. These people carried with them rhythm. Rhythms like no other. And from the very beginning, these rhythms were feared by their so-called masters, overseers of the enslaved, who at every occasion sought to vanquish these powerful, magical melodies from the memory of their property. But over time, these rhythms will reconstruct themselves from anointed DNA and subconscious percussion, mending fragments of forgotten sound molding and shaping, forging new melodies, creating new instruments of survival and resistance, laying the foundation for what will become the soundtrack to beautiful struggle and contemporary social justice movements. Because every movement has a soundtrack. The message is carried by the music. The message is carried in the song. The music and songs of my ancestors, rhythms holy and divine, a royal lineage, the drum beat. The drum beat begot the weary moan, begot the ring shout, begot the field holler, begot the work song, begot spirituals, begot the blues, begot gospel, begot jazz. We got rhythm and blues and rock and roll, we got soul, we got funk, we got hip hop and house. From the very first weary moan, ring shout, field holler, music provided freedom of expression, another form of communication, songs of coded language and covert messaging. Much more than a mere melody, these rhythms manifest into songs of resistance and a call for social change made evident by the blues of the early 1900s that testified to the harsh conditions black folks were forced to endure in a racist America. Songs like Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, which shed light on the epidemic of lynching, racial terror perpetrated by white mobs against black citizens, ushering in the American Civil Rights Movement. Songs like Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn, written in response to the assassination of Mississippi civil rights leader Mega Evers and jazz bassist Charles Mingus, Fables of Fathers, composed as criticism 
for Arkansas Governor Orville Farber's refusal to integrate public schools and John Coltrane's moving instrumental Alabama written in response to the horrific 16th Street church bombing that killed four little black girls attending Sunday school in Birmingham, Alabama. The music and songs that black folks create through generations of oppression will manifest in different ways based on necessity and the conditions in which black folks find themselves in a colonized America. The only constant being the never ending fight for justice and how the music and the language of song are inextricably linked to this struggle. One example of the manifestation of black creativity, social conditions, and music genre can be seen through the lens of the Great Migration, the largest and most rapid internal migration in American history, in which more than six million black folks fled the Jim Crow South. This mass movement of black people from 1916 to 1970 will drastically change the American demographic, creating a new kind of black melting pot in large urban cities. And witness the emergence of the black factory worker with decent paying jobs. And for the first time, this urban industrial economy will provide some black families with a livable wage, giving them the opportunity to simply exhale for a brief moment in American history. The music and songs that black folks create will, will some, some music was, was created by a lack of resources. This urban music of the 1970s is be re the result of uh, more resources. Black schools, black educators, black music teachers, and black parents with just enough money to purchase their children musical instruments. Big, shiny brass horns, woodwinds, drum sets, keyboards electric guitars, and of course, music lessons. No other place in America was this particular musical manifestation more apparent than in the city of Dayton, Ohio. During the 1970s, Dayton was the mecca of funk. That boy, that boy was born in a groove wedged in a place somewhere down deep between a pleading pulse and a signifying sound. Oh, but you should have seen him when he started to crawl, make his way across rooms. And then when he learned to walk, his very first step was on the one, hard and deliberate. Even as a child, always starting something so deep so thick, you could wade in it for years. And when he was a baby, he didn't cry much, just screamed, please, please, please. Not begging, but needing to be recognized, worthy, legitimate. Trying to make sense of it all, at first his mama didn't understand thought something was wrong with the child. And then she realized the reason why she couldn't quite comprehend the rhythm of her birth pain. Remembering the mysterious words the preacher man told her, kneeling down between her thighs, his hands on her swollen belly like he holding a sacred urn. Your baby, a prophet. What? What you say? Your baby, a prophet. Yes, Lord, a, a prophet, a, a divine deliverer, a, a, a badass bringer, a, a show enough, show enough soul singer. Your baby, he gonna change time, set free sound, baptize a nation, save a generation with the hard and deliberate downbeat, uh, your baby, uh, your baby, he gonna make the world funky. Hallelujah. James Brown. James Brown, who most know as the godfather of soul, is also the innovator of the American music genre known as funk. 
and will help define this music created in pursuit of black liberation, black pride, black excellence, and black freedom of expression. Born of hard work and a whole lot of sweat, this new groove of Afrofuturistic sway, rearranged rhythms, outrageous horn sections, and a signature downbeat will also be the accompanying soundtrack to the black arts movement for social justice, the artistic arm to the black power movement, giving the black community new songs of affirmation. Songs like, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. But the more things change, the more things change, the more they remain the same. With the onset of the crack cocaine epidemic, the war on drugs, also known as the war on black and poor people, mass incarceration, slavery by another name, and a shifting global economy, the factory jobs now gone elsewhere, somewhere overseas. The black community will once again face indescribable hardship and suffer from a lack of resources. But yet again, just as in the past, the black community will innovate and create from scarcity. Just as black mothers and black fathers on southern plantations would conjure up meals from scraps, black inner city youth will create a radical new art form that will once again threaten the status quo. We hopscotch, we hopscotch, we double dutch, we hide and go seek. We squeeze light for drips of color. We paint concrete canvas, we mural metal rail cars. We mark our territory chalk on sidewalk. We sing, we dance, we romance, we laugh, we cry, we triumph, we defy. We love, we hate, we debate, who's the baddest, the coolest, what's fly? We scratch and battle, we spin on our head. We know there's always more to be said, so we spit fire into life. We cultivate sound, we harvest rhythm, we crave art safari. We capture elusive movement, we tame wild words. We interpret our world in melody, imagery, and song. We live in language, long, thick, dense jungles. And we don't stop, and we don't stop, and we don't stop, and we don't stop. We never stop. We hip-hop. Hip-hop. Two words, hip, derived from the word hippie from the Wolof language, spoken by the Wolof people of Senegal, West Africa, a verb meaning to open one's eyes and see, to gain intelligence or enlightenment. And hop, derived from the old English word hopian, a verb meaning quick movement. So in essence, hip hop means intelligent or enlightened movement, a new aesthetic created by black youth from the inner city to give voice to the unheard, to question the world around them, as did their forefathers and foremothers. But what has happened to this art form? What songs are we singing now, and why are we singing these songs? For me, finding the answers to these questions came to a head one Sunday afternoon. The events of that day will serve as the impetus for my seeking my quest for understanding the complex nature of colonialism and the nuance of what happens to our black, our creative, our artistic expression inside a colonial environment. It was February, Black History Month. I was participating in my local library's annual African American read and reading some of my original poetry to a group of very attentive bright-eyed children. Afterwards, as I was leaving, this little boy, about 10 years old, with the most beautiful smile, came up to me and said, I really like your poetry. And do you know you are wearing Malcolm X's glasses? <laughs> I marveled at the child and thanked him, thanked him sincerely. I mean, what a cool thing for a little boy to say. Malcolm X's glasses. It made my day. I thought of his future and it seemed bright 
with possibility. Leaving the library, driving to a nearby restaurant, still smiling, still thinking of the, of the bright-eyed little boy. As I parked my car, another vehicle pulled in next to me. They were playing their music rather loudly, but that's okay. Sometimes I play my music loudly, too. When I got out of my car and turned around, there was another little boy, younger, about five years old. And he was making every valiant effort to sing along with the most vile, self-destructive, toxic lyrics one can imagine. And that smile that was briefly about my face was now, now gone and replaced with serious ponder. And I wondered, what will become of this precious little boy if he continues to sing this song and other songs like this? Later that evening, I was sharing a story with some friends about the two contrasting little boys, about how the one little boy was singing this song glorifying criminality, drug use, misogyny, murder, materialism. That's when this teenage girl who had been sitting nearby, apparently listening to our conversation, emphatically interjected and said, but y'all don't understand. Y'all don't understand. It's our culture. It's our culture. And it was at that moment, that precise moment that I realized the seriousness of the thing, the magnitude of it all. What I considered no less than a diabolical assault, a cruel and calculated campaign of psychological warfare waged against and upon the minds and souls of our children a campaign of psychological warfare perpetrated by the same corporate masters who sought to, to prevent my ancestors from, from assembling in a circle to sing songs around the beating of a drum because they knew what a song could do, that there is no magic more powerful than music. And I was filled with dread because the script had been flipped. And we were at war for the souls of our children, and they had weaponized our music. They had weaponized our creative, artistic expression. They had turned our songs against us. And I remembered what the colonizers said. You want to change a people's culture. You start by changing their music. Them knowing that the oppressed will always create art sing songs that testifies of their oppression, that they cannot stop this African, this indigenous, this divine drumbeat, this exquisite rhythm. So they seek to destroy our youth and our communities by altering and changing the cultural language of our songs. If in fact there is no magic more powerful than music, then what kind of spells are these toxic songs casting? 